On today's Minute of the Apes, there are far worse ways of wasting time. Welcome to Minute of the Apes, the daily podcast where we break down every minute of the Playing Ape movies one minute at a time. I'm Todd. Your kickoff there was from Richard, and I know we've got Sean because he's over there looking at me real scary. And the weird thing is, is down below, Richard's also got Zayas, and I can't decide who's scarier, Zayas or – I'm sorry, the lawgiver. The lawgiver, lawgiver, thank you. The lawgiver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the weird thing was is Sean's expression was just a little bit close to what I see behind Richard's face as well. Yeah. So it was kind of like, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> How are you guys? Doing all right. Yeah. 20, happy, New Year. happy New Year 2021. It's whole 2020. Hold my beer. Hang on. Let's get going. Yeah. I mean, reset the count after six days, right? That's right. So- we, had a good, we had a good six days. So here we are, ready to kick off another movie. Have we had enough of a break to to be ready to do this? I'm in it. I'm let it, let's do it. Let's make it happen. Yeah. You know, um, talk about some apes. Yes, we need some apes in our life. There, there might be some apes around everywhere else. There, there's very apish behavior, but hey, we're only here to talk about the planet of the apes. And Richard had a lovely tease there for us off the top. Yeah, Richard, what was that? Explain to us what that was. All right, so uh, in doing a little bit of research about battle, uh, I found the New York Times review from July 13th of 1973. It's one of those old school reviews where they still list the theater that the movie is playing at in the review itself, just so the audience knows. Back, back before we had like, the ability to search, and, and, and uh, I, this is even before like movie phone, if anybody remembers that service. Uh, and it was by Vincent Camby, and it was the final line of his review. There are far worse ways of wasting time. <laughs> he, he, he didn't seem to really like the movie, but he didn't hate it either. So he was kind of, it was a mixed bag of stuff. He said there's some lukewarm. There's, there's some lines in here that are quite charming and witty and fun. Uh, he, 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 in his final paragraph, he also said, this one's not going to win any awards. <laughs> it was like, a, <laughs> it really was a little back and forth. But again, there are far worse ways of wasting time. So let's do it. Nothing right, like a backhanded compliment, right? Right. Yeah, like if you're thinking about it, eh, if you got the time, it's not going to kill you. If you need some air conditioning for 90 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and in 1973 in New York, yeah, they might have needed air conditioning. If it's July 13th in the middle of summer, it's got the yeah. sweltering uh, uh, humidity coming off of the ocean there, the water there, for sure. So we start this one, this the fifth in the series – and I'm curious right away, Sean, being the neophyte, those of you that don't yep. know, if you're joining us just now, Sean's never seen these movies. He knows nothing about them other well, than the, 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 the old the ones, the original ones. Right. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what I meant. We, he's never seen these. He doesn't know anything outside of the geek folklore that tells him what to think. Sean, with that in mind, you've seen four of these. I know I knew absolutely nothing about this one. And where do you think we're going with this one as we step into it? I I think this feels like it's going to be the transition from, you know, the last movie was apes are, you know, rising up against man. The trailer says there's been a nuclear war and we see, you know, apes and man kind of living out in the wild together. It feels like this is going to be the transition where apes actually take over man and be, it actually becomes the plan of the apes and man becomes diminished. And it'll be more about the war of who's going to take control between the, the three ape factions versus is man going to be part of this anymore? I think that's a pretty damn good guess for not really knowing what's going to happen here. Um, let's get into a little bit of talk about, the film itself and of course when Todd wants to do this because this is the first time ever 
that I get. We changed up the way we're doing this. Yeah. yeah, that that I finally get what I want, which is we're going to less editing for Todd. Yes, we're going to do these where it's I actually play the 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 uh, sound bites in with it instead of editing them post. So if I have moments of going, uh, that's where they come from. But this film continues the trend that we saw previously, which was lower the budget up the expectation because this one has a budget of 1.7 million. It is again directed by Jay Lee Thompson who directed the previous film, did a, a decent job visually, a little disjointed of a job, Otherwise, but it may it uh, costs one point seven million. It runs eighty six minutes, and it goes on to make eight point eight million. So that's not bad. That's a decent yeah. profit, yeah, for sure. But you know, once again, the the Hollywood community looks at it and says we're going to have diminishing returns from what we've made on all these others. So let's diminish the budget. That immediately says to me, uh oh, we're in for trouble. Yeah. What can we do, right? Yeah, and so, again, with Sean having never seen these before, he watches these one minute at a time accordingly, but he has told you and I that he's watched the, the clips I've already cut up and and provided, and, and I, I would not say that expectations are high. I will tell you right up front, wow, I haven't watched this movie in forever, and I did sit down to watch the entirety of it. I I'm really curious for this film. I, I, I hate that, that that we're going along and seeing these, and, and each of us going, "Wow, what did they do with this?" But wow, why did why did they make this? Is already my feeling, but I still love so much about it. This has got Roddy McDowell back in it. Um, we, we've got one of my favorite people in the whole wide world playing in this film. And that would be musical composer Paul Williams. Yeah, Paul Williams. I love Paul Williams. I loved Paul Williams as a kid because, hey, number one, he's shorter than I am. Number two, the man. <laughs> That's hard to do. The man writes music that you didn't realize you knew. He's just one of those kind of very cool people. And here he is in this movie. And I've teased that when we get done with this movie, I'm trying right now, and I've already started this ball rolling. We're going to try to assemble some interviews. And Paul is one of those people I'm trying to get because one of our viewers turned me on to that he's very open to speaking to people. So with right. everyone with fingers crossed, we're going to have Paul Williams on this show. Here we go. Right, fingers crossed. Let's hope so. All right. So with all of that said, why don't we uh, talk about what's going to happen in today's minute? Unless anybody else has any housekeeping stuff they want to put in here. I think we're good to go. Uh, Sean, do you want to tell us what's all going right. on with this minute? We're going to start minute one with a fade up from black onto a tree branch and ends with Cornelius saying, come on. All right, here we go. Let's take a listen to minute one, a battle for the planet of the apes. In the beginning, God created beast and man so that both might live in friendship and share dominion over a world of peace. But in the fullness of time, evil men betrayed God's trust and in disobedience to his holy word waged bloody wars, not only against their own kind, but against the apes whom they reduced to slavery. Then God in his wrath sent the world a savior, miraculously born of two apes who had descended on earth from Earth's own future. And man was afraid, for both parent apes possessed the power of speech. Come on! As of minute one, we have no idea the count, so I'm going to start it up tomorrow. <laughs> oh, oh, I was not expecting that. I didn't know if I should jump in <laughs> right there. Uh, wow. So we begin a movie completely with just a recap. I don't yeah. know that. Well, well we, we have a little bit of voiceover. And we then have the a, recap. Right. We have the lawgiver kind of establishing it. For some reason, we're in 2670 AD. I'm not sure yeah. why we're in 2670 Which, AD. If the last movie was in 1994, that puts it 676 years in the future. Right. And if the first movie was uh, the year almost 4,000, 3,900 and something, that's 
it's 1300 years away from that. Yeah. It's so 600 it's like away a, from the one before. Mm-hmm. Seems a really arbitrary kind of place. Yeah. Very strange place to pick up the movie whenever it starts in the, in the future, but then goes into a way flashback. So is when we get to the actual movie itself, is that still technically a flashback or not? So the so the lawgiver the, was the lawgiver the one who wrote the original scrolls as well, and then we have a lawgiver who kind of just moves forward in time. That's uh, a great question. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, I know we find out later, but one of my first notes was: is this the lawgiver? Because it, oh, know, yeah, I guess it, yeah, he didn't identify himself, did he? Yeah, they haven't identified him actually at this point. Yeah, uh, my just, first my my first reaction was: is that John Houston? Because he's had <laughs> such a distinct voice. Well, funny you should mention that, Sean. I yes, know. it is. Yeah. Uh huh. How the role... did they get him for this film? But go ahead, t- tell us about John Houston. Well, in a nice little twist, one of my very favorite people. In fact, if you look right over my shoulder, you'll see who they originally wanted for this role. They wanted Orson Welles, and he said, "Ha, uh-uh. not doing that. Not putting on makeup." Which, ironically, Orson Welles was known for that he never appeared in film without makeup on his nose. He despised his nose, and he was willing to cover. It, but he would not wear the makeup. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to commit to <laughs> doing it. He didn't want to go that, that deep into it. Right. He wanted people to know who he was. So they turned to John Houston. John Houston, the famous director of Sierra, uh, Treasure of Sierra Madre, had done many things they turned. And he apparently, to what I could find, very willingly said, okay. Came out for a couple <laughs> I, of days and did his work and was gone. And it immediately gave him prestige. I'm, still, I'm sorry. I'm still imagining a drunk Orson Welles in full orangutan makeup, like he, like in that commercial where he's doing the vineyard stuff. And, ah, I'm the lawgiver. <laughs> that would have been great. <laughs> ah, <laughs> in the in the beginning, nobody tells me how to do the accent. Anyway, sorry, Ty. No, that's quite all right because I also, as an Orson Welles fan, I'm very used to the fact. Oh, you mean the fat guy that was always drunk and talking about wine? I'm like, oh <laughs> yeah. god. You know, he had kind of a bit of a history beyond that but yes that very same guy how do you get the bottle in the damn mouth <laughs> john houston was already an award-winning phenomenal uh screenwriter and director at this particular point and i don't know the fifth movie in a franchise with a reduced budget budget yeah and the it's- fact that the, the last couple would not have been you know very received very well i just don't know why he would come in and go hey sure why not let's do this I mean, he, the only he, thing I can imagine is it, it was a one or two day shoot where he's only at the beginning and the end of the movie. So, you know, it's yes, he's in a lot of makeup, but he's only going to be in makeup for a day. So, yeah, but I mean, I mean, you know, you've, you've already got the, all the accolades you need. Do you really want to come in and do this fifth installment hey, you know, of a dime series? For um, a scene? I, think, I mean, I think it was um, was he hoping Bruce for an Campbell, action figure? Who, I think it was Bruce Campbell who said it. You know, sometimes you do a role because you really like the pa- the project and you're very passionate about it. And sometimes you do the role because the air conditioner broke at your house and you need to get it fixed. <laughs> John Houston was hard up. <laughs> Maybe. He wanted to make his next movie and needed that little extra scratch. Yeah, he just needed a little get between. T- yeah. You know, I do, think, just, I do think we have to remember that this is – it is a different time. John Houston is a very different director in a lot of regards because – he he has that prestige that you're talking about, Richard. I mean, he he made some films that you look in, even from the beginnings of his career to the latter day, acting and directing both. He it's it's a career you cannot diminish at all. However, he's friends with Jay Lee Thompson. He knows him. He's willing if that call comes. He's like, okay, sure. And he yeah. walks in just like Sean said. Probably said, here's some drinking money, and moved on. And and so I kind of agree with you, but at the same time, I'm not surprised because those guys at that time were all willing to scratch each other's backs and say, okay, I can do it. All right. Fair, fair. It just, it was just unusual. And I was like, that's John Houston. What? <laughs> yeah. I was the same way. Yeah. Huh? I, I mean, I, I didn't, you know, uh, looking, re- watching this back now, the, the, the time, uh, the, the actors really didn't stand out to me in terms of like recognition so much. So it was kind of unique to go back as an adult and, look through these again and go, Oh, that's that, that's just that, that, that person. That's this, that's that. And and for those, so, of you, those of you too, that don't know John Houston, I mean, go out. This is a, a director that, of significance, not only because of his body of work, but he did a lot of interesting things with world war two, shooting actual documentary footage from the actual war itself. He was one of five directors sent out by the government 
to do mm. this. And some of that footage alone, you just 